My path in voiceover was very non-traditional. I actually have a degree in business and a degree in Spanish and um, uh, parlayed that into working in the Silicon Valley in, in California for 10 years, working in all manner of um, startups, uh, venture capital and, and going to their startup companies and building a company from four people to hundreds and, and on and on. Um, and really uh, uh, struggling to enjoy life. <laughs> So um, serendipitously, I was, I was out with my, my now husband, and we were talking about dream jobs. And I said I'd always wanted to be a voice on The Simpsons. And two weeks later, I was getting ready for work one of those fateful mornings. And um, Nancy Cartwright, who's the voice of Bart Simpson, was on the radio to promote the movie, and started talking about voiceover and how it was this incredible job. And we in the San Francisco Bay Area had a school right nearby that was incredible, and, and I called that day and I started taking classes that week and two years later I had an agent and I quit my job and moved to Los Angeles and here we are today. <laughs> my first job was uh, as Katya in The Walking Dead which was incredible. Um, you know it was a, a round of auditions that came through my agent in San Francisco. I auditioned for Clementine, I auditioned for Lily, I auditioned for Carly but there was something about Katya that spoke to me um, but she required a Belgian accent. So I went out and I researched Belgian as much as I could and I had a Belgian friend and I followed him around with a tape recorder for two days and I'm sure he thought I was a psychopath and, um, and turned in uh, my audition for Katya and, um, and booked it. <laughs> and it, it was probably my second or third audition ever as, a, as, a, as an actor um, and, and that was my first job and it, it changed everything. Working with the team was amazing. It was so genuine, and, and um, you know they really just wanted us to care about this this person. And, and it was my job to to make her live and breathe, and um, and to give her reasons to to love her hot-headed husband and, and reasons to hate other things. You know, <laughs> to be an actor. Um, but because of that job, I met some of my closest friends to this day. Um, you know, Melissa Hutchison, who's Clementine, is one of my best friends. Uh, Owen Thomas, who is Omid in the series, and Gavin Hammond, who's Kenny. And, you know, we all met uh, after we had filmed, after we'd recorded this game, and said, oh my god, you're, you're Clementine, I'm Katya, can you believe they did this to us? Oh, it was crazy. But it was such a bonding experience, where normally in games you could share a hundred credits with someone and be like, eh, yeah, that was cool. Uh and it doesn't really matter. But this one was just lightning in a bottle. And, and you know, also through that I met Sean Vanneman and Jake Rodman, uh, Rodkin, and we went on to do uh, Firewatch. And, you know, that game just changed everything. It changed everything. Firewatch all came from The Walking Dead. Uh, so I met Sean and Jake, as I mentioned, working on The Walking Dead. And Sean reached out to me shortly after season one had wrapped. And he said, you know, uh, I've left Telltale. I'm writing a new game with a female protagonist. Are you in? And as an actor, that is the greatest call to get. Um, and I said, yeah, of course I said yes. And, but it was you know, a good two years then until we actually kind of got down to the nitty gritty of, of recording. And of course, you know, I went through the whole range of emotion at that point of like, oh, have I been replaced? Have they found someone else? Am I still in the running? Is it still gonna be me? You know, all the self-doubt that we go through as actors. Um, and they had me record a sample track uh, back when her name was Alice. And, uh, and we did, um, you know, kind of a test run for them so that they could hear how I would be as her. And then they went through their process of finding Henry, which was for them quite arduous. They, they auditioned several people who just didn't quite fit the bill and, and they couldn't find who they wanted. And then uh, Rich Summer was talking with one of the Campo Santo guys on a, on a tabletop game Twitter feed and he was like, hey, I'd like to audition. And they were like, okay. And he just nailed it. So. From there, we started recording. What they did, which was so wonderful as an actor, was they let me be in my home studio, and Rich was in his home studio, and Sean would Skype us in together, and we would have actual conversations, actual dialogue, which, as video game voice actors, we typically record and avoid. Um, we might have a director who knows what they're talking about, we might not, but we never get to interact with the other actors, the other characters in the scene, and so to have this game that really hinges upon believable dialogue be a dialogue, it was game-changing, pun intended. <laughs> what I look for in a character is something I can really hold on to. Um, I love three-dimensional 
well-written, well-thought-out characters. It's, it's really easy to write a flat character, a uh, damsel in distress or, or uh, you know, um, whatever. But I, what I really gravitate towards, which I think shows in my resume, are the characters that are deeply flawed somehow, but they're never going to tell you how. You know, there's Joyce in Life is Strange and, and what happened to her to get her to the point that she is at with this man in her life. And then, you know, Delilah and, and what did she go through to get to where she's at and, and Katya even. And um, I like finding the meat and really digging into that, which is not to say that I won't do other characters because we've all got bills to pay, but um, I really like finding well-rounded, juicy characters. I think being able to pick and choose projects is um, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, if you're young and you're hungry and you're just looking to build a resume, it's, it's harder to say you want to pick and choose. However, I think there are certain things we have a social obligation to shy away from. People need to be cast racially appropriately, um, if, if you can help it. God knows sometimes we get in the booth and they're like, by the way, this character is not white. Oh. Um, I think, you know, if, there's, if you have a, a moral obligation to a company and you don't want to do a commercial for them, don't do the commercial for them. Or do the commercial and take the proceeds and give it to charity. Um, I think it, it depends on each person's station. You know, if they're, if they're in a place where they're comfortable turning down work, great. Um, games in particular, I think, uh, I think there's enough work for everybody. My favorite thing about Delilah is that the player has to decide how they feel about her without knowing what she looks like. They don't know if she's buxom. They don't know if she's beautiful. They don't know if she's X, Y, and Z. They just have to decide what conversations they want to have with her based on uh, how funny they think she is or how, how interesting they think she is. And that's so rare. It's so rare that we're unclouded by physical appearance in, in real life and in games. I am hopeful for the future of, of roles for women in voiceover and in and, and video games, and I think it's it's evolving. Um, you know, you're seeing more female leads and uh, options for female leads, and even you know um, LGBTQ leads and and uh, non-traditional leads, non-white. You know, I think it's we're getting into a place where making games is becoming more accessible for smaller teams, and they're able to tell different stories with different voices. And I think that's just going to proliferate more and more, and I'm here for it. I am here for it. <laughs> well, I think with games, you have an opportunity to make a proper game with fewer people. You can't make a movie or a television show with fewer than, I don't even know how many people, but you know, Firewatch was made with a team of eight. Um, I know people who are making games solo, you know, one person writing this entire game. I'm making a game with a friend of mine, you know what I mean? So it's. It's not going to be Uncharted 4, but you know, it's going to be its own experience. And we have that option now, whereas in games and uh, in movies and television, it still requires a full crew, which is not necessarily the case in games. I would say the difference between AAA and indie is that I have more of a say in my character, which is not to say the AAAs aren't open to it, uh, but usually it's gone through such a process to get to where it's at that it's pretty written in stone. Whereas indies, um, it's a little more uh, on the fly. You know, there's option for discussion about certain things and, and, um, and input where we have less in AAAs. My inspirations, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, in video games, voiceover in general is such a supportive community. Just so many incredible people who really legitimately want each other, all of us, to succeed. And I, I have been so graced with Melissa Hutchison from The Walking Dead and Jennifer Hale and Courtney Taylor and Ashley Birch and all of these generous, loving people who, who are willing to help their friends. And, and, uh, and that's been invaluable. You know, commercially, um, I met uh, Mary Lynn Wisner early on and she, she kind of gave me the confidence boost that I needed and, and really believed in me in that meant more than anything. I met my agent before I was anything and, and he kind of pulled me aside and said, you've got it, so work on it and find me when it is ready for public consumption. And again, that confidence boost was, was kind of exactly what I needed at the moment. I want all the roles. I, I would love to do a female bond. 
I would love to do, um, you know, Wonder Woman. I, I want all the things. I want all the things, all of them. <laughs> Best thing about voiceover is I can be anything. I have been an 80-year-old woman. I have been a 12-year-old boy. I have been every manner of creature in between. It doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter my age. It just matters if I can do it believably and interestingly. That's it, that's the secret sauce. The worst thing, if there is a worst thing about voiceover, is, uh, you know, it's a gig economy. I could have a great year one year and a terrible year the next, and I, I'm always hustling for that, uh, for that next paycheck. So it's trying to figure out where that's gonna come from, how to keep it sustainable, how do I keep doing it while I get older. Uh, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> um, just going down that path. Um, yeah, I'd say, but you know, I'm happy doing what I'm doing and I, I'm, I will be bagging groceries at the grocery store before I go back to corporate. <laughs>